Fakarongo Kitefenua, it's Maori, which is an official language of New Zealand. So actually, English is a de facto language, but the official language is Maori and uh, New Zealand language sign. So uh, this name came because of a proposal that a group of us did for the government about data science at scale, and then from there we started to keep evolving. And I want to tell you where is this now. So essentially, it's a report. This is something that will keep me busy for the next 10 years. And I hope to do stuff in a clever way together. Why? Because there are big challenges that we need to look at. So climate, population, not just the production, but the waste, the figures about uh, food that is not reaching the, it's produced or it's not distributed. I mean, it's thrown away. It's just incredible. I started to read about this a number of years ago, and then it doesn't matter if the percentage are more or less than percent, there are 50% of food is just wasted. I came into this interesting world. It's not a green peace kind of thing. It's really uh, an answer to certain things about, uh, okay, if we are going to deal with climate change, I have some echo. So it's uh, degrowth is just okay. Let's stop consuming madly. Let's rearrange certain things. And the pandemic created opportunities for that. Now, this is not a small thing. This is not like eating an elephant one piece. It's, it's a big, it's a herd of elephants. And remember that metaphor. So big science, mega projects, all involve big compute. And big compute is something that brings us together in one way or other. So, that's the, let's say, the, the visionary talk when, why are you doing this? Because these are challenges. And these are challenges that you start to think at my age and circumstances. Instead of going fishing, you start to think about your grandchildren or your mokopuna. So that's yours truly with my granddaughter. And this is the River Thames. And she lives in London, like a good son of a Kiwi. So why? they are not coming back because New Zealand is not necessarily a thriving country in a number of ways. Well, why cannot try to do that? So let's see how did we end up in this big compute thinking at big scale. The past decade, we have been playing, and when I say we, is a number of us here, and they are already mentioned there. So the Square Kilometer Array Radio Telescope, it's, if you are not familiar with it, now you need to search for the Square Kilometer Array Observatory, which is apparently the largest civil engineering or IT civil project in history. There were thousands of antennas between Western Australia and the Karoo Desert in South Africa. And it was originally planned to process 157 terabytes per second. And uh, uh, reality tells you otherwise, and uh, a couple of speakers will comment about that because they have been involved in the technical side of that. But uh, I am using that uh, figure to showcase that when you think in terms of what could be done or what you want to be done, reality sometimes tells otherwise. So big science and mega projects are interesting beasts. So the SKA was something truly global. I mean, literally, we dealt with teams in all time zones, and it was, yeah, it was fun. So before the pandemic, we used to use Zoom with Zambia. And then it's normal. But what I learned is the concept of platform. So we can do a lot of uh, technology here and there, but where is going that to stay? Who will, more than host, where will this live? So we did some work, and these are official documents, hello, official documents that you can find here. And my name is somewhere here, but essentially why I am talking about operating systems and platforms, and then later I will talk about cybersecurity. Well, we did some work about this, and we did some questions about this at some stage, and we were asking ourselves in 2016 or 17, what happened if there is some issues at low level on at the BIOS or here and there? And the answer was always, oh, the vendor will take care of it, or the vendor will take care of it. And no one gave a damn about those comments until I had my Christmas present in 2017 or 18. It was called Meltdown and Spectre. 
So suddenly my thread in Slack and SKA was become the most popular. Well, this guy has been asking questions about what happened at uh, a chip level. So, and I just wanted to highlight this. My background comes from always building companies. Actually, I literally have a degree as a migrant. You do a degree in your new country. So I have a Master of Entrepreneurship from the University of Otago in Dunedin. So the story goes like I am trained to build new ventures, which once they are up and running, I pass to MBAs who destroy them, who manage them. And the guys who are smiling, I guarantee that have MBAs. So I always think in terms of a startup. So things that needs to be from inception until keep up and running, and you have Gabriels coming through you all over the life cycle of the project. So this is, and then I never went into the SKA for the radio astronomy or for the science. I always wanted to think, okay, we can look at platforms on that could be applicable for something else, because I mean, no. Not everyone is interested on the origins of the universe, which is the thing uh, supposed to do. And all we thought about the applications for the New Zealand, uh, I mean, not just the industry, but as a country, is the primary sector. So we had some thinking with some of us, and then we came to the conclusion trying to simplify that from an IT point of view, from an entrepreneur point of view, from a a uh, guy who's trying to bring things from a different perspective, these are the five core challenges that we try to summarize here. So number one, everything that you use in the primary sector in agriculture is old. So even if you are using an iPhone 14 Pro, the technology here, even if the newest chip or whatever, it's already five times year old between design and reaching the market. So whatever uh, Samsung is going to show us today will reach the market in a few years time. But the question is why we cannot start to think about using those technology today. So, and I started to tell that in a controversial way and I'm trying to be polite instead of old, I say mature technology. But we are a community of clever people. We can think about how the world will look like. So my, and I won't extend on every point as much as I'm doing now, but imagine if you are a business owner in 1985, and I tell you that in 2007 this will exist. How would you operate? I give you 5, 10, 15 years to adjust all your systems. This is low-level innovation, but still, it's an innovation that needs to make things happen. So that, that's, that's the whole concept of mature technologies, and for a number of reasons that I hope to discuss in the panel, I think that it's not that Agritech is slow on accepting digitalization. It's like things are arriving for a number of reasons at a different speed. Of course, by now you read the heterogeneity issue, the integration. And I want to give a word about this. We in IT, we saw this 50 years ago. We saw when every vendor tried to be, I mean, when software was just part of the whole product. So you, got, you bought something, and you never got fired by buying from those guys. So you bought something, and they gave you everything. Well, this is happening these days when you go into the primary sector. I mean, company A is giving you the entire solution. Guess what? On that process, is also capturing a lot of your value, which is not only production, it's the data. And that's a topic that we will discuss, hopefully. Of course, when you have a heterogeneity, you have the integration issue, which is a different challenge. Now, when you do go to a school of business, you learn that a regulation is the best way to create a market. Governments are desperate to meet the Accord of Paris or IPCC or whatever, and they throw, this needs to happen in five years. This needs to happen in 10 years. It's not just trivial. And finally, the cybersecurity issue is not just bugs. I mean, everyone is measuring everything. Have you ever checked if those sensors are reliable? I can keep going. I won't. So in which context? In which context I'm trying to solve these things? So I saw this totally, totally high level, and we can argue. This is from Raja Koduri from Intel. Probably many of you know him personally. I thought it's a, it's a, it's a good context. So it just simply says that this, in the decade of the 80s, we had uh, the 
the connection, then we got into the cloud, and now exascale for everyone. Whatever that means, that's Intel um, branding or something. But the concept is, when I go back and I say that all technologies, everything that is going into the market now for the next five or 10 years is uh, based on non exascale concepts. And that's the disruption that I'm trying to think. So when I throw this into people of the HPC world, they say, well, what that means? It's not that you're not taking seriously, but it's, it's vague enough. Of course, when I throw it to the Agritech, they, what is this? Then I use this other slide, which is courtesy of the Wageningen University. If you haven't been into that side of the world, this is like Stanford, but for the primary sector, right? So, and by far, by far. So, uh, courtesy of one of the researchers there. And this is just, you just throw an amount of buzzwords there from our point of view. But the people from the primary sector say, oh, I see this. Now I see what are you trying to say. So, uh, we have the decision-making thing. We have the food integrity, because remember that the COVID happened because it was a food security thing. I mean, uh, someone was bitten by a bat and then you lose your job. I mean, <laughs> there are consequences here and there. So then you have the public decision on all these words and then the science and technology. And you, of course, you throw blockchain and AI, but actually people from non excess scale areas, they, okay, I know where you're coming from. I know what are you trying to put together. Now, uh, this is precisely courtesy of Ian Foster. This was a submission that they did in 16 or 17 for other stuff. And it doesn't necessarily matter to see exactly what it says, but I want to see the difference between where it's the thinking that I'm proposing was listen to the land versus what it's out there. So this is reality. And then you have the sensors and everything, and then you have, let's call it cloud-based analytics or the digital twin or the series of digital twins. But the visualization of what's happening down and you bring it either with data from the cloud or you are, okay, here is your virtual reality. There's not much discussion about what happened under the hood. And then it's going back into the platforms, into the basic stuff, into the networking, into the hardware, into the scalability, into the cybersecurity. And that's what I try to replicate with this different, they call it base plane in this. So I just want you to have the visual idea of this. Huh? And when I say what's available, what I'm trying to say, of course, if we're going into this, it needs to be an open source software, open source solution to address the integration, to address the heterogeneity. When I speak, I know that it's not open source hardware, that it's an open source standards, but RISC-V is something that we all talk about, and who has been at SC22 and heard Chris Tiasanovich talking about that, well. An affordable sensor not necessarily means cheap. It means that you can actually deal with them, manufacture, distribute, establish. It's, uh, because I will show you a couple of examples of non-affordable sensors in a minute. And then my open question is, should we be discussing between underlying platforms versus IPIs? I always say that New Zealand is an apps nation. So we discuss about clever things, zero or other stuff, but we are hostages of people who produce platforms, namely uh, hyperscalers or whatever. And that's a hostage situation that I want to challenge people in government or even vendors that, that it's a sovereignty challenge. Sovereignty issue. So, and then I submit that the concept of system of system, because you have a system here, you have another, and then let's talk about everything, and that's the system of systems that we call it a digital nervous system. So, are we being clever? Are we inventing something? This has been our created around, so of course the inspiration of SKA is set at home, we, maybe some of you actually been there? Anyone has been using SETI at home once in their lifetime? No? Yes, of course. One, two, three. Yes, of course. Don't, don't raise the hand too much, but yes. <laughs> uh, they, Destiny, this is Destination Earth. Uh, I know that, Karen, you have been collaborating or they took your material. This is a European Union project to create the weather 
digital twins, a, a digital twin of the Earth to replicate a weather model to see how things can go. And it's a decent, uh, recent size project. Good idea. All the best for them. They are hostages of the cloud provider. In the SKA, the hardware, the infrastructure is SKA owned or whatever. Destination Earth is a sort of NASI relation type of thing. They rely on European HPC, which is okay. But what is cool, and not sure, did anyone heard about the Project CyberScene ever? This happened in Chile 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago, 1973. It's based on the ideas of Stafford Beer, which was a theoretist in the UK about management cybernetics. And the whole idea was to use technology to optimize production. And actually, if you maybe heard about the socialist government of Chile between 1971 and the Pinochet coup in 1973, in the middle they had a lot of strikes, particularly a truck driver strike. And still they managed to have the economy functioning because people were sending data from the factories to that control system, which never actually was built, but it was, it was built, but it wasn't necessarily operational. But they used telex. 1973, they used telex. And they managed to keep the country operational with only 5% of the truck's fleet by the power of information optimization, supply chain. It's a, it, it's a Wikipedia page. It's fascinating. I mean, I'm originally from Uruguay, so I have some bias about South American solution. But this guy is tough for beer. It's a British guy, right? And this was, uh, it was a mix of not just uh, theory and practice, but also design. I mean, you thought that it would be Star Trek, right? Of course, the militaries they destroy it, but they actually built a prototype for us. It, it's a cool story. Now, when I say competitors, this is people doing stuff today. I mean, FarmBits, maybe even some of you know Randir Chandra from Microsoft is doing. He has the year of Bill Gates. This is money directly from the Bill and Melinda, Melinda Mays Foundation. This, before ChatGPT came up, two or three weeks before, Mineral.ai, it was an X, a Monshoot project, so these things are happening. I don't have anyone from NVIDIA, but we all know someone from NVIDIA. And Omniverse is a funny thing, of course we do. So apart from the BMW, who has the pockets to afford Omniverse kind of thing? And, of, and what's happening with Omniverse? You have a huge amount of GPUs, and, and what's happening? So it's an open question. And of course, when I say John Deere, it's like talking about IBM of the 80s. But why am I mentioning John Deere? It's an old slide, but this is just keep growing. So this is a sensor. But look at the, at the, at the numbers. Not just the control, it's 15,000 measurements per second. Per second. Right? So it's combining everything. And it's combining this, but it's capturing the data from your farm, or your land, or your catchment, or your country, and sending it up to the John Deere cloud. I have nothing against John Deere. It's a free market. But isn't that too free? There, there are questions here which are not just ethical, but business-like. So this is, and, and the, look, it's on, this is the Consumer Electronics Show. So they are not, every year, they are showcasing that deer, like a widget. Which, so you no longer own your harvester. You lease it for half a million dollars, and you don't even have one of the biggest assets, which is the data. So who owns your business? The bank owns half of the land. The software is always in the cloud. Who owns your business? And we're talking about food. <laughs> it's not a trivial thing. So I've been around. I, did, I, I will go a little bit. This is just a show off that I have been around. But it's important to say I'm not telling just because I read something. I actually did the labs for a number of years. So this is a poster that uh, I will show it in a slide. And it's somewhere in the back. It's an old poster. But we started on this precision agriculture conference when I met Ian. And then from there, we keep going. Uh, uh, Jim, maybe you remember that first little workshop that I did, courtesy of ARM in SC19. It was a shambles. I had no clue what I was talking about. But a lot of friends listen and say, meh, meh, meh. And that's how you learn. Uh, this was a virtual thing. Then uh, I've been into literally meetings with farmers. The barbecues are fantastic. 
<laughs> so you go to a beef and lamb meeting, and after the chat, you have the best. <laughs> so, and uh, that's um, big science, big data presentation that we did uh, has a Maori component with uh, a group on Tuyora that I will comment apart if you wish. Um, I want to highlight this, the destination Earth. This is the European Center of Medium Weather Forecast, which uh, I was going to meet them in Germany, but we all got COVID, so we meet later in SE22. Uh, I'm doing a little bit propaganda advertising for the community, but for the non-New Zealander, this is the Minister of Agriculture of New Zealand. And we haven't had any meaningful conversation. For the internationals, it's just to show you how easy it is to just to take a selfie. It's all good. It's all good. So uh, for that to make it happen, it's a different conversation. But I want to highlight my learnings from a little tour that I did. And sorry for the show off, but that's to prove that I actually was there. But this is a sensor, a 30 ton sensor, $5 million, funded by Bill and Melinda. This is University of Arizona and Tucson just to take, I don't know how many petabytes of data from letters. Yes? Sorry. So, um, what did you miss? So, what I was saying is that this is a sensor, and this thing moves, and this will be letters at any given time, and the theory is that if it grows in the desert of Arizona, it grows everywhere. But still, it's a $5 million project that will get into an end and will have a lot of outcomes. But what's happening after that? How do you, ming how you mix that? So all this trip was courtesy of this gentleman that maybe some of you recognize it, our friend Barney. So uh, he has now, um, I can't remember exactly the title, but he has a future of data for uh, University of Arizona and has a component of native um, data as well, which we had a conversation in Germany about that, and that's when he invited me. Uh, but that included a trip to the Biosphere 2. We're not sure if you remember, that was a cool thing. So the Biosphere 2 is actually, there are things happening inside, and I can spend an hour telling stories. But the other thing is, uh, this, which is just a container, they are growing lettuce there. Now, this company has already shipped 100,000 of this. This reminds me, whoever was being in Sun Microsystems 15 years ago, remember the project Black Box, which was throw a data center in the middle of nowhere? Well, you can throw a farm in the middle of nowhere. That's that's interesting thing. So this is the second set of slides. So yeah, he has a non-traditional shirt today. <laughs> so, uh, the whole point of this photo, which was edited, of course, is uh, this gentleman is Niels Weddy, who is the computing lead of Destination Earth, who I did the introduction to them. I'm not uh, claiming any brokerage commission here. Is that how I'm trying to build the ecosystem? Right? And the other interesting thing that I'm sure that Pete will tell us is this device at the top I just want you to remember that this device at the top has uh, things that we want to talk about. That's the computing at the edge that we will be discussing. So uh, Karen has been so kind not just to be here, but to, uh, we had a fantastic uh, series of conversations at the University of Texas. And we had a lot of fun with this guy, which is still IPO or not. And not sure if you can read ARM here. But the good conversation with Eric was that, what I'm trying to sell, what are you trying to build, where is the money? And we came with a very buzzworthy answer, but it's in the ecosystem. Because if you do a product, you do that, you spend literally an afternoon in, this is the ARM headquarters in Texas. And uh, actually, the guy who created this was in Multicore World 2016. I'm not sure some of you remember. Anyway. So Yuma, it's literally a strange place. And I love this. What do I have to do with agriculture? What do I have to do? This was just a funny thing. OK. So I show you a few buzzwords here and there, and in previous slides. These are my buzzwords. What I'm trying to do, what are we putting together? An agriculture decision engine. Well, did you, if you remember, 
uh, let me see to go bah, 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 here. If you see, we have this sort of lines, this thrust. Well, is data coming up and down? That, that's, that's the idea, that's the concept that I'm trying to showcase. It was the uh, multi-scale system data flowing up. But that real-time simulation of complex systems, uh, people think, oh, well, the vendor will take care of it. It's just not that simple. If you do it in a single point or in a small farm or here and there, you know, but once you start to combine stuff, you cannot do that in your laptop. You won't do that with a, a set of uh, iPads. This is big compute. And big compute involves also a lot of I.O., a lot of communication, and the networks, and the power. Suddenly we are talking about stuff that relates to us in other ways. So, and then I came with this heterogeneous distributed computing system. Whatever that means, is the buzzword of the season, we will have a panel on that. Now everyone is talking, okay, let's, okay, we have a lot of information, we are talking a lot of data from the edge, and then we will bring excess scale. Why don't we talk that on the other side? I think that it was a guy called Steve Scott, used to work for you or not. So I challenged him a couple of years ago, uh, what, when are you going to bring Exascale to the edge? And his answer was pretty much world, when you are going to buy it. <laughs> so that's an internal joke with Cray. But the point is, does it make sense? And this is part of the panel that I'm trying to discuss later. So, but what can we done, and this is what I'm submitting, is the core platform. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking on that. And then this is the final, let's say, uh, vision statement. Because uh, you need to say something in order for people to agree or disagree. Where are you standing? Well, for example, the Destination Earth, they are bringing resolution to perhaps one kilometer or more. Why cannot we do at plant level or cow level? Why cannot measure at that? Or why cannot we start to think in those terms? And then let reality or technology or uh, money or market to tell us that we cannot. But why we accept that this is how it should do? So this is where I'm submitting, and that's why I'm telling that, okay, this is an interesting challenge for the next 10 years. Ha! Huh. <laughs> so, if you are not asleep, that's when the th fun thing starts. Can you guess? Okay. So, uh, even if I have 20,000 or 200 million, you cannot do this alone. So, how are we going to do it? It's a fact that needs to be modular. This fact needs to be open source. You need to eat that elephant one bite at a time. The Kiwi way, we, it's a five million people country, but has the size of between UK and, and Italy, so it's not a small country. Now, a peer-to-peer edge-based platform, distributed and client devices, might be the only way to compete with the existing players, or not. Why not? I'm just asking. It needs to be fault tolerant. And when I say absurdly cheap, that means that it needs to work in the first world and needs to work in India. I mean, John Deere is capturing all that data in order to sell those harvesters in Brazil and Afghanistan, everywhere. It's for a number of reasons. And then I asked Topology, I'm mentioning Laura here. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I tried to read that paper, but if we are going to do things for the next generation, why are you not thinking on the theory from the next generation? So the polar fly is a diameter two topology. We need a lot of networking here and there. Why are we using the one that has been working for the last 50 years? Just asking, just thinking, okay? Ecosystems, co-design, workflows, digital twins, AI acceleration, vendor integration. I can start to name each of the speakers, how they enter in each of these things. Now, do you realize why you're here? You're all working for us, or for me, or something. Or we're trying to put things together. That's the whole point, right? Trying to put things together in one way or other. So, okay, you are dreaming, mate. What could possibly go wrong? Well, I tell you what could happen if we don't do something. Uh, media, Bloomberg. 
Modi government just takes whatever data they have, I have no clue, and they give it, or I don't know in which condition, to the big guys, which will, I don't know, digitize, read the article, and sell it back to the farmers, <laughs> their own data. So it's, uh, it just doesn't look good, and it's something that at the time it's possible to make it happen now, what could possibly go wrong? So, blah, 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 have you done anything? Well, we did this little poster, which is somewhere there. It's not very sophisticated, but it's a master student kind of thing. But essentially what I try to showcase here is that you have a problem, which is water management. You take an algorithm from Wikipedia. You take a chip, a, a, a sensor from, I think that is TinyOS. Uh, then you take some data from uh, the Needham Weather Station. You do two or three steps, and the combined compressive power saving is about 90%. So what I'm trying to say to a government official, you have a problem, you do a little bit of totally open source free magic, and you say 90% of your power consumption in whatever context. That's what the only message that I'm trying to convey this is that Let's use the other side of technology to simplify things. Remember the original problems that I mentioned. Doesn't necessarily need to be high tech. Could be uh, mundane tech, but well applied. This was fun. We tried to write a paper to the runtime and operating system for supercomputers, and we ran out of time. It was with Richard, which is not here. Uh, tomorrow or the day after, you can ask him everything about it. Uh, Balas has been a speaker here, Torsten, you know Torsten. I, one day he will be here, Torsten Hoffler. He says that he is very busy in Zurich, and Camille, Camille it's your friend. Uh, I'm, this was fun. It was obviously unceremoniously rejected because I, I got COVID in Germany, so I had no time to design. We even submitted a handwritten uh, diagram, but we got very good feedback two types of feedback from the panel. One was this and that and those, and the other was, and I don't know who was, but I mean, they were thinking about supercomputing from the existing model. Supercomputing the big block, the big uh, engine in the big machine, everything. How on earth can you talk about something distributed? And we talk about 250,000 nodes. That's 80% larger than Fugaku. Uh, we're inventing a theory, but it, it was, the feedback was very, very valuable for two reasons. We learned about the mistakes, but we also learned that we have a lot of minds to change. And the other thing that we submitted to the local government was to, uh, okay, you want to measure stuff, needs to be affordable. So it needs to be in the tens of dollars. So a farmer can buy hundreds or can be done. So it's here. I don't want to go in the interest of time to keep saying a lot of details, but it was the idea. Okay, how are you going to bring all this data? Well, let's start to prototype. Let's try to do the pilot. And let's have actual ground truth. Okay? So I'm not competing against NIWA here, at least not in principle. It's a completely different approach, which needs to be, I mean, I'm not trying to create an industry, but we have a micro cluster, a microelectronics cluster in Christchurch to design these things. I mean, when I was talking about degrowth, we don't need to think in terms of chip manufacturing at TSMC scale. So the globalization trend is changing. If you heard about the TSMC chair speaking when he was opening, I don't know, $100 billion factory in Arizona or potentially open, uh, things are changing. It's, it's an open question. I am. We can keep talking about this. So, where I'm going? I'm going to ask you for money, sorry. I'm going to say that this is the first step that we could do if we have, I don't know, some sort of uh, funding or some sort, this can be done, can be done even in my credit cards. Right? So, first of all, you need to define what are you measuring. I mean, you can, there's so many things that you can measure and that's the problem. People think that, oh, we are building a digital twin, okay. Which are the inputs? Which are the components? When the, the opening keynote will certainly cover that. 
this is also an important thing. What, what do you accept in terms of error? So when I say about security, I mean, what, what's the margins? Because if you don't standardize your data, everything is going. Every, everyone is looking at visualization. It looks good, then it sells. It's not that simple. So, and there are not many slides. So what I'm saying is that the technology that we can bring into this conversation is those sensors needs to compatibility. How long are they going to last? Are they stable? Can I have them? It's it just, uh, if we're going to build something, what's the life cycle of that? Uh, yes, this is so. When I say co-design towards tech independence, is that what the pandemic show us is that the supply chains can be something that uh, stop things from working. And this could keep, I mean, tech, weaponized technology is not something that just the Trump administration invented. So the things could keep happening and then bring into the interesting technology colonization topic, which is a, could be a full panel. But I just want to, I've been in South Africa a number of times for the SKA project, and it was a riot for students in the last time, and they were protesting against the fees for the universities, and they were said, decolonize science, decolonize science. They wanted to decolonize gravity. And I thought, what are you talking about? Things fall down in any country, any point. Yeah, yeah, but why we need to attribute the gravity to Newton? And that remind me, okay, there are many ways of doing things. I mean, when I was studying engineering in Uruguay, we studied from Russian books. It was a military dictatorship. Our revolutionary thing was to use from Russian books, in Spanish, of course. They were horrible, but they were cheaper and in some ways stronger than American ones. But every theorem, every mathematical definition had a Russian author. Doesn't matter if it was a French guy, or doesn't matter if it was a German guy. It's like the Newton Leibniz dichotomy. So uh, there are a lot of things that are happening. The, the, the biggest challenge that I want to discuss is the topological, sorry, the, yes, the topological model. And for me, topology, I'm coming from the mathematical side of things. And I wonder if that concept of platform needs to have an axiomatic definition for the next generation. I'm opening that question. Anyway, uh, Ian Foster hopefully will talk about 5G, 6G, and we have an opinion about we can do stuff without networks. I mean, the Microsoft Farm Beats, they are using the uh, wide TV band in order to transmit from uh, places which are outside of internet coverage. Anyway, um, getting to an end, these are things that you need to do. And I want to highlight what is, for non-New Zealanders, Matauranga Maori, which is the science from the point of view of the, uh, let's call it First Nation or Aboriginal, if it's Australian or uh, North American name. I mean, uh, the identity of New Zealand, it's blended in a very pretty much unique way, and as such, influence science. And there are hundreds or millennia of not just data, but a different way of doing things. So instead of planting uh, stuff you brought from Europe, you have native plants. And guess what? Those things maybe avoid floods in a different scale. And land is per... Toitu te whenua fatungarongaro te tangata. If you know Spanish, use Spanish phonetics. It's easier. So yeah, there are many things here. But this is even... Uh, Whatever you're building, you're building it with whom? Because otherwise you just find a job in a corporate and keep doing the vertical. So that's why I wanted to highlight my conversation with Eric in ARM. Where is the money? Uh, by money is not for profit. How do you sustain this? Well, with an ecosystem. So I wanted to tell you what I'm doing. I wanted to tell you that I will keep telling you what I'm doing every year, hopefully uh, shorter because it will be much more interesting too. Talent needs purpose. Why are we doing this? Well, for the grandchildren and towards the 2015 type of goals. But this is beyond digitation. This is about technology independence. And, and if I am unable to build anything, well, I just do consulting or I just sell bits and pieces. Nothing will get hurt if this happens. If you are going to, let's say, search for oil and you don't find it, well, you open a petrol station. 
You are at least in the business. That, that's the whole concept. So I'm looking for advice of how to put this together. Towards what? What I'm building? What, what are you going to build? So the concept of topolo topology at the mathematical point of view, the hardcore kind of thing, I'm interested to discuss that. Now, those digital twins, how do we integrate them? Now, we have all these people, or sorry, organizations building stuff. Our competitors, will we cooperate? How do we make it scalable? What means success? What means success? Just coming to New Zealand and have a fantastic conversation, that's success, all right? So, uh, shall we do a birds of a feather and supercomputing in Denver? Can we get together on that? I mean, we have done some stuff with Pete in when IoT intersection HPC years ago. Should I try to submit that paper to Ross again? Is anyone willing to talk about that? Um, there is a scientific digital twins, birds of a feather, and SC23, Mesmer is from NVIDIA Bureau, you know them well. So, Let's do something else from here to the next multicore world. Now, memorandum of understandings uh, means nears to nothing, but it helps me a lot. Because if I present that to funding sources, which have maybe not very clear why are you doing that, but hey, I'm doing that, and uh, these guys are supporting in this way. So the case becomes stronger. So. Uh, scientific advisory board, I mean, Professor Fox was so kind to put his name into that in the 2019 proposal. I can do development on the cheap, meaning that if you put together modular projects, bits and pieces, I had offers concrete from the University of Auckland Computer and Science Department. It's not much and involves a management, everyone knows how these things could evolve, but in a clever open source way, you can build that. So our friends of Catalyst has a lot of experience on that. And then the Rian's uh, conversation will happen later. So money, hey, come to Multicore World, sponsor it. More importantly, help me to submit grant applications. I cannot pay $300 per hour consulting in order to write in the way that government officials are used to receive sponsors, uh, sorry, proposals from uh, Crown Research Aid on that. So it's a, uh, we can do that. I am doing that, actually. I am in a proposal with uh, for a smart idea, digital twin for fluid resilience. It, whatever happens. Joint ventures, uh, contracting. Uh, this trip, for example, in, in the US, uh, Barney, I mean, I spent five days in his place. That saves me a few thousand dollars. And most importantly, he organized all that trip. So I landed, he picked me up from the airport, and from there we did probably 3,000 kilometers in five days. That's like what I call a good friend. All right? And then we went to Austin, we had a fantastic dinner, we went to Dallas. So those things for an entrepreneur a little bit mad, more than the money is the time, and okay, we are into some way. All right? So, I want to thank Catalyst and Coldplay and send you because uh, I'm a consultant. So those are my retainers, those pay the bills. Don't think that I make money out of this conference. So if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Remember when I say that when, how do you eat an elephant? Well, this is a herd of elephants. That's what I'm thinking about. And it's doable, it's totally doable if we do it together. And I saw this on a t-shirt in Oliver Tambo Airport in uh, South Africa, so oh, this is this is good. So let's go far. Thank you. Oh, this is my granddaughter, by the way. <laughs> That's when you clap. <laughs>